This is chapter five, the structure and function of large biological molecules. So there are four main types of biomolecule building blocks for all life on Earth. So we have things like nucleic acids, so DNA, RNA, uh, carbohydrates, so your sugars and starches, lipids, um, so things like triglycerides, phospholipids, steroids, and proteins right, that make up pretty much everything else. So proteins are things like um, hormones, antibodies, enzymes, and they have a wide variety of functions. So in this chapter, we'll look more in depth at each of these different types of biological molecules that make up life on Earth. So these macro or large molecules are referred to as polymers, right? so poly meaning many. So macro molecules, right? just macro meaning large as opposed to micro, right? polymer as in consisting of many similar building blocks. So these polymers are built from multiple mono or single units um, that are kind of linked together. Um, so carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids are true polymers um, because they're built and based off of these individual building block monomers. Um, so I always like to think of the analogy with Lego building blocks, right? So you have your individual Lego blocks, right? And you can put these different Lego blocks together, right, to form a polymer or different structures. So this is basically what our cells and our bodies do. So we have... We take nutrients from right, our food, our digestion, um, these building block monomers, um, say for proteins. Right? So say you eat a hamburger, um, your body breaks down the meat, the protein, into the individual amino acid building blocks. Um, and then you can build your own proteins with those. You can build some protein um, for your own muscle development. Using the same set of building blocks, we can build multiple different types of polymer structures. So these polymers are going to be synthesized or put together, linked the monomers together by removing water and vice versa. Remember most chemical reactions are reversible so we can go the opposite direction and when we break down these polymers into their individual monomer building blocks we would just add water. Um, so a lot of these chemical reactions use enzymes, which are specialized protein macromolecules that help to speed up and facilitate these chemical reactions, um, such as those that make or break down our polymers. We said a dehydration synthesis. Right? So dehydration is the removal of water. Synthesis is right, you're building something, you're synthesizing something. So when we add two monomers together, um, we're going to remove a water molecule, so H2O, um, and then replace the H2O with a covalent bond. So now they're linked together to form our polymers. And then reversing this reaction is hydrolysis. So hydro meaning water. Lysis means to split apart. So we're using water to split apart these chemical bonds. So essentially the reverse of the dehydration reaction. So we add a water molecule, we break the bond, and we replace that original H2O right, to separate those two monomers. So polymers are very diverse in their structure and function. It's pretty much all of, majority of the molecules that make up our cells and bodies are polymers, right? these more complex biological molecules. So one cell can have thousands of different types of macromolecules or polymers. Um, so the type of macromolecules can vary among cells of one organism um, and vary more within a species and even more between different species. Uh, plant cells have a cellulose cell wall, right? so they have a different type of macromolecule than, say, our human or animal cells. Right? So the macromolecules that make up the cell membrane are going to be lipid-based, whereas the macromolecules that make up a muscle fiber are going to be protein molecules. Right? So we have a huge variety of different types of these polymers, these macromolecules that make up and contribute to the functioning of a single cell. Um, and this huge variety of polymers can be built from just that small set of monomers. So it all uses the same kind of set of those Lego building blocks. Right? So all proteins um, essentially are made from the same amino acids, right? whereas 
carbohydrates, right, sugars and starches, right, have just a few basic building blocks that can create all different types of more complex molecules. So we'll look at these um, more in depth as we go along. So starting with carbohydrates, so the main function of carbohydrates is to serve as cellular fuel um, as well as a building and structural material. Carbohydrates include the sugars, um, so simple sugars, single sugars, things like glucose, fructose, um, and then polymers of these sugars would be your more complex carbohydrates where we have many sugars linked together. So the simplest of the carbohydrates are the monosaccharides. So the monomers are the monosaccharides. So mono is in just a single solitary sugar. Um, so glucose is what our cells use um, for cellular respiration to generate ATP energy because it's um, most readily broken down right, and converted into um, that energy molecule. The macromolecules would be your polysaccharides, so many sugars. Um, so many sugar building blocks linked together. Um, so we'll look at there's different types of polysaccharides depending on how um, these monosaccharides are linked together um, and which type of monosaccharides are linked together. Most carbohydrates have molecular formulas that are usually pretty simple and they contain only carbon, hydrogen, um, and oxygen. So where we get the carbohydrate, so hydrate is in water, so H2O, um, and then carbon. So carbon hydrogen and oxygen basically um, is all these sugars consist of. Uh, so we said glucose C6H12O6 is our most common monosaccharide um, so it's going to be used in cellular respiration to synthesize ATP um, but there are different types of monosaccharides classified based on how many carbons they have in their skeletal structure. So some monosaccharides, like glucose, have six carbons. Um, some, like deoxyribose, only have five carbons. Looking at molecular formulas of these sugars, they're often drawn just kind of as a carbon skeleton. Really, a lot of them will form these um, rings. Um, so we said monosaccharides are a major cellular fuel um, and raw material for building some of these more complex molecules. Um, remember the dehydration synthesis reaction. So we remove a water right, to link two glucose molecules together. And now we have a disaccharide maltose. Right? So disaccharide uh, just is composed of two monosaccharides. So di means two, so two sugars. Right? Um, another example of a disaccharide would be glucose and fructose. Right, so we have a six-carbon sugar bonded to a five-carbon sugar. So this is your fruit sugar um, to make sucrose. So these covalent bonds um, between the two monosaccharides are called glycosidic linkages. So it's just a specific type of chemical bond that tells us we're dealing with um, glucose or sugar molecules. So we'll see as we look at the other types of biological molecules, um, their specific type of chemical bond will just have its own name just to kind of tell us what type of molecule um, is involved. So whereas the monosaccharides were primarily used for kind of cellular fuel, the more complex carbohydrates, the polysaccharides or the polymers, um, have more complex structural um, and storage roles. Um, so one example is starch. So this is the polysaccharide used in plants. Right? So starch, um, so think like starchy vegetables, potatoes. Right? So this is how plants store their excess glucose. So when they undergo photosynthesis, they're synthesizing glucose, right? and they store that excess glucose as starch. So we have kind of just a linear chain of these glucose molecules linked together. They can also store their surplus starch um, as granules um, within the chloroplasts or other um, parts of the plant cell called a plastid that we'll look at later. Animals, um, like us humans, we store our excess um, polysaccharide as glycogen. So it's similar to um, starch in plants, right? similar in function. Right? It's just our storage form. Right? Um, so they have more of kind of a branched arrangement. Um, so it's stored mainly in the liver and in the muscle. Um, 
So whenever our cells need some extra energy, right, so say if you're exercising and your muscles need some extra energy, they can tap into that stored polysaccharide glycogen um, in the muscle cells to release individual glucose molecules to use for um, cellular respiration and ATP synthesis. So essentially we'll have enzymes that just go in and snip off individual glucose molecules as needed. Another type of polysaccharide that we'll look at is cellulose. So this is also only found in plants and it's more of a structural um, polysaccharide. So instead of um, being used as a source of energy reserve, this one is more going to contribute to the overall shape and structure of the plant cell itself, the cell wall. So cellulose is a major component in the tough cell wall um, that we find in plant cells. So similar to starch, it is a polymer of glucose. It is a polysaccharide, but the main difference is those glycosidic linkages. So the way that the monosaccharides are linked together. Um, so the difference is based on the two ring forms for glucose. So you have alpha um, glucose and beta glucose. So with starch, basically the hydroxyl, the OH, is all going to be on the same side. Right? So this is considered the alpha glucose um, linkages. For cellulose, it alternates. So we have one on this side, one on this side, one on this side, one on this side. So this is considered the beta glucose monomers. So the alternating configuration um, is what's going to be the main difference between cellulose and starch, but it translates into um, these overall functional differences. Right? So we have our um, cellulose linked together to form these bundles, right? um, these fibers, uh, which is going to compose that tough, thick cell wall um, and be a major component of plant tissues like wood. So we said enzymes work to help us synthesize and break down some of these polymers. Right? So enzymes that digest starch are going to hydrolyze or use water right, to break apart those alpha linkages. But enzymes are specific for certain reactions. Um, so the enzymes that break down the alpha linkages in starch can't break down the beta linkages that are in cellulose. So it requires a different type of enzyme to hydrolyze those reactions. So cellulose in humans um, typically just passes through our digestive tract as insoluble fibers. So we're not able to break down cellulose right, or that type of plant material. So this is why what happens when you eat corn. right? It pretty much comes out looking the same way because we can't break down that cellulose. However, there are some microbes um, that can break down cellulose because they do produce those specific type of enzymes. So many herbivores like cows, um, rabbits, and even termites, right? So how termites are able to digest wood, that tough um, plant material, is because they do have those mutual or symbiotic relationships with these particular bacteria that produce the enzymes and help them break down the cellulose and get the nutrients from it. We also have bacteria in our gut that produce different enzymes to help us digest our food um, and break down certain nutrients. We just don't have the particular bacteria to break down cellulose. Chitin is another structural polysaccharide. Um, they're not as common as cellulose. Um, so this is found in the exoskeleton of arthropods. Um, so things like lobsters, um, insects, um, basically bugs and sea bugs, as I call them. Um, it also is going to provide structural support for cell walls of many fungi. So things like mushrooms will have, instead of having cellulose in their cell walls, they have chitin, which is still a polysaccharide. So we have the, the monosaccharides linked together. They just have a different functional group attached to their monosaccharides. So a bit later when we look at nucleic acids and DNA, we'll see carbohydrates can also help form parts of other larger molecules. So the backbone um, of DNA is composed of 
a 5-carbon sugar called deoxyribose. They'll also be on the surface of some cells. They use carbohydrate chains um, as identification tags, so our cells are able to distinguish from one cell to another or distinguish between my cells versus foreign cells. Um, so cell recognition, cell signaling are also part of the role that carbohydrates can play in cellular function. Our next group of biological molecules are lipids or fats. Um, so this is a diverse group of molecules, but one thing they all have in common is that they are hydrophobic, meaning that they do not mix with water. Right? Um, so they're one class of large biological molecules, but they don't include true polymers. So they don't have a true monomer or kind of Lego individual building block like the other ones do. But they're different types, um, and they all share that common feature of being hydrophobic, just meaning that they mix poorly with water. Um, all lipids consist mostly of a hydrocarbon skeleton, right? so they're still pretty simple molecules. Biologically important lipids that we'll look at are fats, phospholipids, um, and steroids. So your standard fat are what's called typically a triglyceride. Um, so they're constructed from two types of smaller molecules that are joined by a dehydration synthesis reaction. So we have a glycerol right, with three carbons um, and then three fatty acid chains, right, hydrocarbon chains. So using a dehydration synthesis, right, we remove H2O from each of these fatty acid chains. And now we have our triglyceride molecule with three water molecules kind of remaining left over. So there are two different types of fat or fatty acids. So it all has to do with the number of hydrogen atoms that are bonded to the carbon chain. So you may have heard of saturated versus unsaturated fat. Well, what they're referring to is how saturated or full of hydrogen are those molecules. So your saturated fatty acids have the maximum amount of hydrogen atoms possible and no double bond. So they're completely soaked and saturated with hydrogen. So as a result, their carbon chain is very straight right, and linear. Unsaturated fatty acids mean that they have one or more double bonds, so they don't have as much hydrogen as they could. So maybe some carbons are bonded to double bonded to another carbon instead of an extra hydrogen. So they have little kinks in their fatty acid tails. They're not very straight and tightly compacted in. So your saturated fatty acids um, or saturated fats would be more solid at room temperature. So things like butter, um, bacon grease. I mean, um, so most animal fats are going to be saturated fats. So your unsaturated fatty acids or unsaturated fats are going to be oils or liquid consistency at room temperature. So plant fats um, and oils, fish oils, typically are going to be unsaturated. So texture-wise, the reason that the saturated fats are more solid um, is because they're all linear and straight. So we can pack more in more tightly as opposed to these that have all these little kinks and stuff in the tail. There's going to be more open space between the molecules. So consuming lots of these saturated fatty acids uh, may contribute to cardiovascular disease through plaque or fat deposits in the blood vessels. Hydrogenation is the process of converting our unsaturated fats into saturated fats by adding hydrogen. Right? So when we hydrogenate, we're adding hydrogens to make something that was previously unsaturated into now saturated. So these hydrogenated vegetable oils can also create unsaturated fats called trans fats. Right? So these trans double bonds. Remember, cis and trans, those isomers are basically the kind of mirror images of each other. These trans fats, when they're talking about trans fats, like in things like margarine, where you see hydrogenated vegetable oil, it's basically just a tub of trans fat. Um, so it's believed that trans fats are even more bad for you than saturated fats and natural saturated fats like butter. So in some cases, it might be better to just go with the natural butter or bacon grease as opposed to some artificially hydrogenated margarine.
The primary function of fat is energy storage. So we mentioned before that fats carry more energy or calories per gram than the other types of nutrients like carbohydrates or proteins. So this is why we store long-term food reserves as fat cells or adipose tissue. So adipose is just the anatomical term for fat. We also use adipose tissue to cushion some of our vital organs and help insulate the body. Another important type of lipid are phospholipids. So phospholipids are basically just modified triglycerides. So triglyceride, we had three fatty acids bonded to a glycerol molecule. The phospholipid, we trade one of those fatty acid tails now for a phosphate. So this is where we get the phospholipid. The fatty acid tails are considered hydrophobic, meaning that they are repelled from water. They don't like water. Right? But the head region with the phosphate attached is going to be considered hydrophilic, so it's water-loving. So this is what's going to constitute our cell plasma membranes. So when we add phospholipids to water solution, they'll self-assemble into these double-layered sheets that we call a bilayer. So we, later when we talk about the cell membrane, we'll say it's a phospholipid bilayer. So it's a double layer of phospholipids. So the hydrophobic tails are going to point in toward one another. So they are facing each other away from the fluid. They're kind of insulated away from the fluid inside and outside the cell. And the hydrophilic heads right, are facing the fluid environment. So this is going to form our boundary for our cells to separate the internal cell components from the external environment. So we're able to kind of regulate what comes in and out of the cell through this membrane. Steroids are another class of lipids um, that are characterized by a four carbon ring structure. So we have four carbon rings kind of fused together as the base skeleton for steroids. So there are lots of different steroids produced by cells in our bodies in particular, um, but they all have that same basic four carbon ring structure. Cholesterol is one of the most important types of steroids. Um, so we use it in our cell membranes to help um, stabilize the membrane. It's also going to be a precursor um, for the other steroids that we use in the body. So things like cortisol is um, our stress hormone. Aldosterone um, is a steroid hormone that helps with your sodium and water balance, water retention. Progesterone, estradiol, estrogen. Um, so these are sex hormones. Testosterone, the male sex hormone. However, too much of anything, right, it's usually not good. So a high level of cholesterol may contribute to cardiovascular disease because it is still a lipid and a fat, right? So it can contribute to that plaque forming um, and build up in the arteries, which can inhibit the blood flow. Waxes are a special type of lipid um, that are composed of just long chains of carbons, typically with ester groups um, or alcohol groups attached. So waxes are synthesized by many plants and animals. Um, so plants produce a waxy cuticle on their leaves to help prevent water loss. Um, animals like birds, they produce wax coating on their feathers to make them more waterproof. Right? Beeswax is a well-known wax. And humans, right, our earwax to help prevent things from getting in our ears. right? So it can trap dust and debris from getting down deep into our inner ear canal. So out of all of the biological molecules, proteins probably are the most diverse in function and structure. Um, so proteins account for more than 50% of the mass in most cells, the dry mass, so excluding the fluid and the water portion. So human body contains up to a million different types of proteins. So proteins could be things like hormones, um, could be enzymes, could be antibodies, hemoglobin in the blood, Keratin in your skin, hair, and nails right, are all proteins. So enzyme proteins are used to help speed up chemical reactions. So we talked about enzymes can help facilitate those dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis reactions. Um, pretty much every, just about every chemical reaction that takes place in the cell will have its own specific enzyme to help 
facilitate that reaction. Um, we'll talk more about enzymes in a little bit, but generally they're named for what they do. Um, so again, if you ever see ACE at the end of a word, um, that means that we're talking about an enzyme. So this particular enzyme is called ATP synthase. So just based on the name alone, we can infer that it's an enzyme that synthesizes ATP. Some other functions of proteins can include defense, um, so things like antibodies, uh, storage, transport, cellular communication, movement, and structural support. So we'll look at a few examples of those. Again, enzymatic proteins are going to speed up or accelerate chemical reactions. So in this example, digestive enzymes are going to catalyze or speed up the hydrolysis or breakdown of the chemical bonds in our food molecules. And again, we said some of our, those enzymes are actually produced by the bacteria that live in our guts. Defensive proteins help protect against a disease, so antibodies um, are actually composed of proteins. Right? So they help to target um, and inactivate viruses and bacteria. Storage proteins can store nutrients or um, amino acids. So one example is ovalbumin or albumin, which is basically just egg white. Right? So it's going to provide nutrients for the developing embryo inside the egg. Transport proteins help to transport substances across the membrane. So our cell membrane, we'll talk about later on, um, is a pretty good barrier at keeping things out that we don't want in. So we have to have special protein channels or little back doors for certain things to get across that membrane. Um, another example would be hemoglobin. So hemoglobin transports um, oxygen through the blood and the cardiovascular system. Right? So it's able to carry other molecules across the cell or through the body. Hormone protein. So hormones help regulate lots of body's um, cellular activities. So insulin is a common hormone right, that's released to regulate blood sugar. Receptor proteins are going to receive chemical signals and messages from other cells or nerve cells. Contractile and motor proteins are in uh, muscle tissue, so what allows muscle to contract. Structural proteins um, are things like keratin, so the protein in hair, um, collagen in the skin and connective tissues, um, elastin is a protein, um, so in elastic tissue like in cartilage in your ear, um, so those are all structural proteins. Enzymes are specific types of proteins that act as a catalyst just to speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy required to start that reaction. So imagine if we're trying to roll a ball down this hill. So if we have to push our ball over this steep hill, it's going to take more energy right, to get it going down to the bottom of the hill. So if we lower that activation energy, right, we lower the steepness of that hill, which is what the enzyme does, right, we just don't have to use as much energy to get that ball rolling. And enzymes are very specific for the type of chemical reaction that they catalyze. Right? So again, going back to structure reflects function, the shape of the binding site of the enzyme right, is going to determine what type of molecules can fit in it and be catalyzed by that enzyme. So an enzyme will bind to the substrates, right, or whatever chemicals or molecules it's gonna react with, um, and then facilitate the chemical reaction to give us our product. Um, and again, enzymes always, not always, but mostly will end in ACE. So if you ever see a word ending in ACE, that's a dead giveaway that it's an enzyme. And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times they are named after what type of chemical reaction they catalyze. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme that makes DNA polymers. Lipase is a lipid digesting enzyme. Right? Lactase breaks apart lactose. Protease breaks down proteins. Amylase is another common enzyme that we'll talk about again. Um, but it breaks down starch. So this is produced by the saliva in your mouth. So when you start to eat something starchy, so say if you're chewing on a piece of bread or a cracker, if you chew on it for a few seconds and just kind of let it soak in your saliva, let that amylase start to work, um, you'll see that that starch starts to 
taste more sweet. So you'll be able to um, start to taste the individual glucose or sugar molecules in that starch. Right, so. so despite the diversity of structure and function in all these proteins, they are all constructed from the same set of 20 amino acids. So amino acids are the monomer building blocks for proteins. Um, so they're organic molecules that contain an amino group, right? so an NH2, and a carboxyl group. So this is where we get the amino acid. So all amino acids have the same basic structure. So the only thing that makes them different are these R group side chains. So these R group side chains um, are shown here in yellow. So they all have the same right, basic skeletal structure, amino acid structure, um, and then they just have different functional groups or side chains um, to distinguish between different amino acids. But all of the diversity in proteins that we see come from this set of 20 amino acids. And then later on, we'll look at protein synthesis and how all 20 of these amino acids are coded for by those four letters in the DNA. So the type of chemical bond between amino acids is called a peptide bond. So remember with carbohydrates, we had the glycosidic linkages. I'm just telling us that we're talking about saccharide or um, carbohydrate chemical bonds. Well, peptide bond just tells us we're talking about amino acid or protein chemical bonds. So when you have a polypeptide, um, we're talking about these unbranched polymers built from linking together these individual amino acid monomers. Um, but it's still going to use that dehydration synthesis reaction. So we remove an H2O right, to form that peptide bond. We have our water left over. So then a protein is the biologically functional molecule that consists of one or more polypeptides. So kind of the end result um, of putting all these amino acids together. So we'll look at there's different levels of structure and complexity that these proteins can have. So, so again, everything that kind of underlies biology is that structure reflects function. So even down to the molecular and chemical level. So the specific activities or functions of proteins is the result from their specific three-dimensional structure. Right? So functional protein consists of one or more polypeptides that will have a precise twisted shape that's folded or coiled right into that unique specific shape. And it all goes back down to the sequence of amino acids that is going to determine this three-dimensional structure. Right, and then again, the structure determines the function. So the shape of um, the protein is going to determine what it can do. So, for example, the function of a protein usually is going to depend on its ability to recognize and bind to some other molecule, like with enzymes. So enzymes are specifically shaped to bind to their specific substrate. So it's kind of like a lock and key mechanism. Later on, we'll talk about how there are some ways that you can turn off enzymes by essentially changing the shape of that binding site. So they're no longer able to fit their substrate and carry out their reactions. Um, antibodies, we said were proteins, so their shape is going to be very important in recognizing specific pathogens right, or antigens. So this is a picture of um, the COVID virus with antibodies. Right, So our immune system makes specifically shaped antibodies that can recognize and bind to those spike proteins on the surface. So they're only going to recognize and bind to those spike proteins. They're not going to be able to fit these surface proteins of, say, a flu or a different type of virus. So even protein structure um, at the cellular level right, can have um, an effect on the cellular function. So with hemoglobin, that's the protein that carries oxygen in our blood. So normal hemoglobin right, leads to normal red blood cell shape. So they flow smoothly through the blood vessels. Right? With sickle cell anemia, um, there has been a change in one of our amino acids that make the hemoglobin protein. So that's going to have effects downstream where now we change the shape of the hemoglobin. So instead of being like this little ball shape, this little globular protein, it's now more of a strand or a fiber 
type shape that causes the overall cell shape to change into these sickle cells. Right? So the sickle cells aren't going to flow as smoothly through the blood vessels and can potentially get stuck and block blood flow. There's four levels of structural organization in protein. The primary structure um, is just the sequence of amino acids. Secondary structures, as we continue to grow our amino acid chain, right, um, then it can start to coil or fold into an alpha helix or a beta sheet. And then the structures can just kind of build on one another from there. So tertiary or third level structure will then um, consist of some of these folded beta sheets and some alpha helices bonded together. And then quaternary or fourth level structure will be when we have multiple polypeptide chains kind of glob together. So these are sometimes referred to as a globular protein. So like hemoglobin is a quaternary, more complex protein structure. So primary structure, we're just looking at the sequence of amino acids, so kind of the chain formation. Um, so kind of like the order of letters in a really long word. And again, this all goes back to and is encoded by the genetic information. So those four letters in the DNA code for specific amino acids. So we'll look later on about how protein synthesis works. But essentially, those four letters, depending on the arrangement of the four letters, can code for different amino acids. The coils and folds of our secondary structure result from hydrogen bonds between repeating constituents of that polypeptide backbone. So essentially that primary structure, that amino acid chain, starts to get really, really long and it will either twist on itself into an alpha helix or it can fold over, fold itself into a beta sheet. And then when we combine multiple secondary structures, right, they build up to a tertiary structure. Multiple tertiary proteins can build up to a quaternary protein. So these tertiary proteins, overall shape, is going to result from interactions between um, those different R groups, right, or those side chains. So it could be hydrogen bonds, um, ionic bonds, hydrophobic interactions, so where they kind of repel one another, um, or van der Waals interactions. But whenever you have a strong covalent bond, um, we could have what's called a disulfide bridge. So di meaning two, so we have two sulfurs bonded together um, just to help reinforce that overall structure. And then finally, quaternary or fourth degree structure, fourth level structure results when you have two or more of these complex polypeptide chains to form one larger molecule. So collagen is a fibrous type of protein where we would have three or more polypeptides kind of twisted and coiled around like a rope. Um, hemoglobin is a globular protein where we just have kind of a glob of these polypeptides that has four different polypeptide chain. So two alpha, two beta, right? and each one contains a central heme group. So heme is the pigment that's going to bind to um, the iron and the oxygen in the blood cell. So if you have four polypeptide chains and each chain contains one iron and heme, right? so it can contain one oxygen, so one hemoglobin molecule total can transport four molecules of oxygen. So going back to structure reflects function, any slight change in that primary structure, so just the order of the um, amino acids can affect the overall protein structure and function. So again, going back to the sickle cell anemia example, so this results from a single amino acid change, right? which if we go back to the DNA, it's really just one letter in the DNA is off, right? but that has more far-reaching effects right, when we get into actually making that protein because now our recipe for the protein has a typo in it. So the abnormal hemoglobin molecules, right, they're going to be different in their shape and their structure and therefore their function. So they're not going to be as efficient at transporting oxygen and they're going to be more likely to get stuck in the smaller blood vessels. Some physical and chemical conditions can affect structure 
parts of proteins after they've been synthesized. So things like pH, uh, salt concentrations, temperatures, other environmental factors can cause a protein to unravel, essentially lose its shape. So when a protein loses its original structure, um, this is called denaturation. So the protein has been unwound um, and unraveled. Right? And because structure reflects function, when we lose the structure of our protein, then it can no longer function. So sometimes uh, proteins can be renatured, so they can be reassembled back to their original structure, um, but it's pretty rare. So more than likely, when it loses its um, structure, when it's been denatured, it's also going to lose its function. So one example is frying an egg. Right? So you can't unfry an egg. So when you add temperature to the egg, Right. So that albumin, the egg white, the proteins in the egg white are going to denature and unwind and form new cross links to form that more solid egg white texture. The amino acid sequence of a polypeptide is encoded by genes in the DNA. So again, it's the sequence of the letters right, that are spelling out the instructions or the recipe for these proteins. Right? So which amino acid goes first, which amino acid goes second. Right? So again, a gene is just a specific region of the DNA that codes for one complete protein. So we have a gene for hemoglobin production, right? a gene for insulin production. So genes consist of DNA. And DNA is a polymer called a nucleic acid that's made of monomers, so their single building block units are called nucleotides. So one nucleotide is just one building block for the entire DNA molecule. So it consists of a sugar, a phosphate, and one of those four letter bases. So there are two types of nucleic acids. We have DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, which is ribonucleic acid. The function of DNA is to basically provide the genetic blueprint right, for all life. So it provides directions for its own replication, as well as um, directs the synthesis of messenger RNA to control protein synthesis. So basically it has all the recipes and instructions on how to make proteins that make cells. So this is called gene expression. So how do we go from the letters in the DNA right, or the recipe, right, the letters on a page in a cookbook, to a three-dimensional protein right, or functioning product of our gene? So the central dogma of biology and gene expression is that DNA is transcribed or copied into RNA and then translated into protein. So the gene in DNA is going to direct the synthesis of a messenger RNA. So basically we make a template or a temporary copy of just one gene in the DNA. And now we can take that copy of messenger RNA. It's going to carry the message that's encoded in the DNA to the ribosomes, which are parts of the cell, little organs in the cell that are going to translate that message and make the protein. So the protein synthesizing machinery directs um, production of our polypeptide. So it knows which amino acids to add in which order based on the order of the letters in the RNA and DNA. So the flow of genetic information, let me summarize, DNA, again, just transcribed or copied into RNA and then translated into protein. Right, so I always like to use this analogy of baking a cake because I like to bake. So say you have a big cookbook. Right. You go to this library, the nucleus of the cell, where all the DNA is. So there's all types of cookbooks for all types of cakes and recipes. Right. But you don't want to make every single type of cake. We only want to make a vanilla cake. Um, in this particular library, you can't check out any books. So you can't take any of the DNA out of the nucleus, but you can make a copy right, of the recipe that you want. So I find the recipe for my vanilla cake on one page, and I can take that RNA copy of the recipe out of the library to my kitchen right, in the cytoplasm, so outside the nucleus. 
Right. So in my kitchen, I have my mixing bowl, which is my ribosome that's going to put together all of my amino acid building block ingredients, right? put them together in the right order. So if you know, if you've ever made cake from scratch right, or baking from scratch, you have to add the ingredients in a certain order. You can't just dump everything in all at the same time. So following the instructions in that RNA, right now we mix the ingredients in the appropriate order, follow the instructions, and now we have a three-dimensional cake that we can eat, so a functioning product or protein. The nucleotides are the building blocks or the monomers for nucleic acid. So DNA and RNA are both composed of nucleotides. So all nucleotides are composed of a five carbon sugar, right? sometimes called a pento sugar. So penta means five. So pento sugar is five carbons. And sometimes if you see hexose sugar, hex means six, so six carbon sugar. But nucleotides, five carbon, pento sugar one phosphate group, right, so that PO4, and then one of those four nitrogenous bases. Right? So the bases would be A, T, C, or G, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine for DNA. Right? So later on we'll talk about RNA has one exception. RNA uses uracil in the place of thymine, right? but it's still going to serve as that base in the nucleotide. So the portion of a nucleotide without the phosphate group, so just the sugar and the base, sometimes is referred to as a nucleoside, so the base and the sugar alone. All right, so maybe when we're looking at um, kind of which side of the DNA molecule we're looking at, we're looking at the nucleoside base. Um, so this would be where kind of that those rungs of the DNA ladder are going to form on the nucleoside of the nucleotide. So of the four bases, there are two types. So a pyrimidine um, is a single six-ringed structure. Right? So it just has one single ring in its structure, right? six carbons. Purines have two rings in their structure. So they have a six carbon and a five carbon ring. So one way I always remember this is pyrimidine is the larger word but it's the smaller molecule. Purine is a smaller word, and it's the bigger molecule. So adenine and guanine are going to be your purines, thymine and cytosine, um, and uracil in RNA are going to be the pyrimidines. So you will always have one purine bond to a pyrimidine when we have um, that double helix structure. So when you have the rungs of the DNA ladder, You'll have A only bonds with T, G only bonds with C. Another difference between RNA and DNA is the pentose or 5-carbon sugar that's used in the backbone. So in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. So that's where we get deoxyribonucleic acid. In RNA, it's ribose. So RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So the only difference between these two is oxygen. So ribose has an OH deoxyribose is missing an oxygen, so it's been deoxyed, right? So deoxy, remove the oxygen, right? So DNA, RNA. So DNA structure is a double helix, right? So we have two strands of these polynucleotides, or these two polymer strands, so multiple nucleotides linked together to form kind of this twisted ladder structure. So the backbone of the ladder molecule um, they're actually going to run in opposite directions. Right? So if you notice, we have here on the left-hand strand the phosphate. Right? So remember, a nucleotide is a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. So the phosphate is on, say, the top um, on the left-hand strand. The right-hand strand is essentially kind of flipped upside down, or what's referred to as anti-parallel. Right, so normally if things are parallel, right, they're on the same level, facing the same direction. So anti-parallel, one strand is going to be flipped upside down or anti from the other strand. So these two opposing strands run in opposite directions um, in what's called the 5' prime to 3' prime end. Um, so we'll talk about this later on when we talk about DNA replication. So it just has to do with which direction we're going to add um, new bases to when we synthesize DNA or RNA. But essentially the 5' prime N is always going to be the end with the phosphate group attached. So on this side, this is our 5' prime. 
this is our three prime over here since it's anti-parallel it's going to be the opposite so now here is the five prime and here's the three prime so one DNA molecule can contain thousands of genes right? so remember the genetic code basically the instructions or recipe for proteins right, is going to be in the sequence or the order of those letters so just like our own language we're depending on the order of letters in the alphabet right, we can make different words so the letter c a t cat has a different meaning or codes for something different than r a t rat t t c would code for a different amino acid than e t a Again, only certain bases in DNA can bond and pair up together right, through those hydrogen bonds. So adenine only ever pairs with thymine. Guanine only ever pairs with cytosine. So this is referred to as complementary base pairing. This feature of DNA structure makes it possible to replicate and make copies, identical copies of our DNA uh, when our cells divide, which is kind of important. Right? We don't want any mutations. We don't want to leave any genes behind when we make new cells, which we're pretty much always constantly doing. So this is also shown in what's called Chargaff's rule, which basically just says you'll always have an equal percentage of adenine and thymine as you will guanine and cytosine because they're always going to occur together in the same amount. So say if you have... 20% um, of adenine, then you're also going to have to have 20% of thymine to pair up with that. Okay, so then that accounts for 40% total of the genetic code. So then the remaining 60% has to be guanine and cytosine. And because they're going to also be equal, then you would have 30% guanine and 30% cytosine. Okay, so they're always going to be in equal ratios um, and percentages. So RNA, in contrast to DNA, is only single-stranded. So this is because RNA doesn't replicate itself. So it doesn't need a second strand. So we said the double-stranded nature, that complementary base pair rule for DNA, made it possible to make identical copies when we replicate our cells. So essentially each strand serves as a template to make a new strand. Well, RNA is a temporary messenger molecule, essentially. So once we translate the genetic code that was transcribed or copied in the RNA, it's going to be you know, just discarded and broken down. So if we need to make more RNA, we'll just transcribe more from the main source in the DNA. Um, another difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA uses uracil in the place of thymine. It's going to function the same in that it's going to bind to adenine. Um, it just uses uracil. So this is one way we can distinguish between DNA and RNA when we're looking at the genetic codes or sequences. So DNA um, is always just going to be this double helix kind of located in the nucleus for genetic information. RNA can have a few more functions. So we've talked about messenger RNA. Um, mRNA is going to carry the message encoded in the DNA. Um, there's two other types of RNA that play a role in uh, gene expression and protein synthesis. So ribosomal RNA is going to combine with proteins to form the ribosomes. So the ribosomes are just kind of the little organs in the cell that translate and interpret the message in the mRNA. tRNAs or transfer RNAs are going to transfer the appropriate amino acid to the ribosome right, depending on which amino acid is encoded for in the mRNA. But they're all going to work together in that process of protein synthesis. So our relatively new knowledge of genomics and proteomics, so how DNA encodes for proteins, has dramatically transformed biological sciences and opened lots of new doors for us. So now we can use bioinformatics um, using computer software and other computational tools to deal with the large amounts of data from sequencing these genomes. So the genetic code could be millions of letters long. So we can use computers now to help us kind of decipher those genetic codes. So when we look at large sets of genes or comparing genomes of different species, it's a science referred to as genomics, basically the study of genomes.
Um, and then we can take that a step further and analyze sets of proteins that are coded for by genomes um, and their sequences called proteomics, so the study of proteins that are coded for by different genes. So this is how we can learn um, genetic sequences for certain proteins. So example, recent example, so with the uh, COVID vaccines, they've cracked the genetic code, the genome of the COVID virus, so they know which particular gene codes for that spike protein. So now we can use just that genetic code, um, those instructions, um, and use mRNA using just those instructions for the spike protein. Some other contributions for um, genomics and proteomics to biology. So paleontology. So now we're able to um, kind of use the DNA to determine maybe what physical features some of our ancestors may have had. Um, and then some of their relatedness and track maybe migrations and things. So have you ever done like 23andMe where they can track your ancestry based on your DNA? Um, evolution, so we're able to learn a lot more about relatedness among organisms that we may not have figured out otherwise. So now we can look at their DNA, determine how closely related they are genetically. Uh, medical science, obviously lots of new um, doors open and possibilities, contributions to medical science through this technology. Conservation biology, so helping to preserve endangered species. Um, and cloning and things like that, um, and how different species interact with one another in the environment. So we can use DNA and proteins kind of like a tape measure for evolution. So when we're trying to go back and see how related different organisms are. So sequences of genes and their proteins document the hereditary background of an organism. Right? Since all of that genetic information is passed down from generation to generation. So we can extend the concept of this molecular genealogy to relationships between species. We're adding a new tool to our toolkit in evolutionary biology. So in this example, we're looking at the gene in a mouse and the gene in a fly. So everywhere that it's green highlighted is where the sequences are similar. Right? So these gene sequences are 76.6% similar, meaning that, remember, the genetic code is going to code for protein. So if they have the same genetic sequence, they're going to code for the same proteins and produce the same proteins. So the genetic similarity between humans and bananas is about 60%. So we share a lot of common DNA sequences, right? So because way, way back at some point, we did have a common ancestor. Um, so using DNA technology and looking at evolutionary relationships, um, we've determined the closest genetic relative to elephants is this little guy called a rock hyrax. So just looking at these two organisms, you probably wouldn't guess that they were you know, close cousins. On the, they share a branch on their family tree. We look at embryos. Right? So the very early genes for development are all kind of the same and similar because our embryo stages are almost identical because those gene sequences, those very early on coding sequences are very similar, if not identical, starting out. So fish, reptile, bird, and human, right? So we all start out with gill slits, right? Going back to our primitive fish ancestors, uh, we all start out with a tail, right? So obviously we don't, are not born with a tail, right? But our early embryo stage, we still have the code, the gene for that tail development. Um, another interesting application for this biotechnology and looking at DNA, um, kind of like a forensic application, um, is to make sure you're actually getting the type of fish that you're paying for. So there was a study that some high school kids did where they got samples of what was being sold as white albacore tuna at the grocery store selling for $8.50 a pound. Um, so they did some genetic analysis on the meat, the fish meat that they bought from the grocery store and found out through its DNA, it was actually a tilapia fish, which is you know, definitely not tuna and not the same price as tuna. So lots of interesting applications and new doors opened with this type of genetic technology. So to summarize our biological molecule building blocks, we had carbohydrates, 
Right, so the monomers for carbohydrates are your monosaccharides, things like glucose and fructose, um, ribose, deoxyribose right, in the DNA and RNA. Polymer or the complex molecule version will be your polysaccharides, so starch, glycogen, cellulose, um, and chitin. So, so main functions of carbohydrates, energy storage, um, some structural support, so like cellulose. Also going to be formed some structure in the nucleic acids, right? So deoxyribose and ribose help form that backbone of DNA and RNA. Lipids, uh, they're not true polymers. They don't have a real monomer, right? But we said fatty acids um, composed of glycerol with three fatty acids, right? triglycerides. So complex version, different types of lipids. You had your fats, triglycerides, oils, it right? would be the unsaturated fats, waxes, phospholipids in the cell membrane, and steroids with those interlocking four-ring structures. Functions of lipids, so energy storage, composing cell membranes, waterproofing, um, hormone production. Nucleic acids composed of nucleotides, so sugar, phosphate, and a base. They form DNA and RNA. So functions would be genetic coding, like in the DNA and RNA, intracellular messengers, right, to translate that information and carry that information from the DNA through the RNA. Right. Proteins, building blocks were amino acids, right. um, so they form proteins and polypeptides. Right. We had different levels of structure, so your primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. They have the most varied functions, um, so it could be structural proteins, it could be uh, nutrition, transport, hormones, antibodies, etc. So wide range of functions for proteins.